as I'm going to speak to you for a few minutes on a subject which is perhaps a little abstruse, I must try and first of all explain to you what it's all going to be about. The point is that in these days we've learned how to use x-rays in a new and quite unexpected manner. They enable us to see into the structure of solid bodies and to understand to some extent how solid bodies get the properties which we observe them to possess. The point of the method is somewhat is easily explained. You understand that we use our eyes to see objects and to gather from what we see our impressions of their size, volume, appearance and so forth. Now we use for this purpose the rays of light and light we look upon conveniently as a wave motion in the ether the waves having a particular size or rather having sizes which vary about a certain mean value. The objects that we see are all very much bigger than the light waves that we see with. If it were not so, we should not be able to distinguish the details. You can easily get a picture of that if you think of the waves rolling in upon a shore. If the rock that stands out in the mouth of the bay is very much bigger than the waves that are rolling in, it'll make its impress on the wave system. But if it were very much smaller than the waves, the waves would roll over it and nothing would happen. Now, when we look at a thing, we see it because the waves of light that have fallen upon it have been modified. And uh, the analogy of the rock will perhaps make it clear why if your waves are bigger than the object you want to see, no impression can be made upon the waves and there's nothing that you can see. Now the fine objects of which a body is composed, the atoms and molecules, are extremely small. They're even far smaller than the waves of light. Therefore, there is an end, so to speak, to our power of vision when we think of those objects which are so very, very small. Not even the finest microscope that ever was made will bring us anywhere near seeing the atoms and molecules. But in the X-rays, we've got a new sort of light. A light which is something like 10,000 times as fine, as delicate, as ordinary light. And here's our new chance. And that which I want to speak about now for a moment or two is what this new light enables us to see. And when we use the word see, of course, we're not using it in the ordinary sense because our eyes are not attuned to these very fine waves. They're only attuned to the ordinary rays of light. So we have to use artificial means, such as photography and similar methods, but we can manage nevertheless to understand what these fine waves are trying to tell us. And in a word, we may say, with no very great stretch of meaning, that we actually can now see the atoms and molecules in a body. But there is one condition. This vision is only granted us when the atoms and molecules in the body are arranged regularly. For we cannot even now see a single atom or molecule, but we can see a regular array. It's just as if you're looking, say, at a regiment of soldiers marching far away. And because with one united movement, they all move their bayonets 
and the light flashes on them at one instant and you gather a spot of light in the distance. So by that regularity, you've been able to see something which you couldn't have managed without. There's a certain regularity in the structure of nearly all bodies. The regularity is manifested by the outward appearance. When it's manifested very boldly, bravely, you say, oh, here is a crystal. After all, a crystal is simply a body in which regularity has been imposed upon the arrangement of the atoms and molecules in it from the very beginning until it grew to be the size at which you see it. And ordinary bodies that don't look crystalline, nevertheless, are very often subcrystalline, we may say. Crystalline in that little groups of atoms and molecules are trying to arrange themselves according to the proper pattern, but never get quite big enough for you to see. It's curious how the X-rays have told us that ever so many objects we never thought of as crystalline really possess regularity of structure, are really crystalline. Even such things as rubber and wood and the cloth and the wool fiber, they all show signs of this regular arrangement of crystallization. Now, I won't try to describe to you how this is done because the time is too short. But now let's just look for a moment, say, at one or two of the results. Here's a model. Now, this little model is one of the very first that we made by means of these new methods. It's about 14 years ago since we first understood the structure of the diamond. I had the very great pleasure of showing this little model of a diamond in the United States in 1914. And it's connected it and Ithaca and many other places. And the model has helped us much. The balls that we use to make our model represent atoms of carbon. For of course, the diamond is made entirely of carbon. The struts that bind them together represent broadly the bands or bonds that tie the atoms together. Then, what is it that this model represents? For I have to use a ball, a black ball to represent an atom, and a piece of brass wire to represent a bond, and the c atom cannot be like a black ball, and the bond cannot be like a piece of wire. What is the left then? What is the point that this model illustrates? It illustrates structure. It illustrates how the atoms are arranged with respect to one another. And you see how, for instance, each ball is surrounded exactly by four, symmetrically placed. Isn't it interesting to see in this model that the chemist's idea of a carbon atom is realized in actual fact they have told us, the chemists have, for many years, that each carbon atom in a compound, and when fully saturated, as they call it, that is to say, having its full attendance of other atoms, has four in its train. And they're arranged round it in positions which should be all alike. And here, in your diamond model, you discover that the X-rays have told you exactly what the chemists have been trying to say for all this time. Each atom has got four neighbors placed exactly symmetrically about it. When we first made this model up, we had arrived at its satisfactory conclusion about it, and uh, we began to put it together with matches and little bits of wax. And uh, then in our pleasure and excitement at seeing what we'd got, we rushed off to our friend, the organic chemist, and we said, will you come and look at the diamond? And he dropped his apparatus and came along, and he gazed at it for a minute, and he said, why? Look at the benzene rings. We hadn't noticed that particularly, but if you noticed a little ring of six, 
everywhere on the model. That is the grouping of the carbon atoms in rings of six, which is a fundamental feature of organic chemistry. It's the feature which leads to all our knowledge, amongst other things, of dyes and explosives and many drugs. And here in this model is the ring, so to speak, in the flesh. The chemist draws it, always, draws it like this, so. But that is a diagrammatic representation. And here, so to speak, is a big step nearer the real thing. Now this diamond, as you see, when you look at it like that, has a peculiar structure. It's the same however you hold it up like that. And if you've ever seen a real diamond of a tetrahedral form, as they sometimes are, you'll recognize how, out of this shape, can grow that tetrahedral form as it is found in the native state. Now, a word about the scale. Of course, this scale is a very great one. As a matter of fact, the scale is 450 millions to one. So that if a diamond, say, in one's ring were magnified to the size of the earth, then the structure would be of this order, rather bigger than this, but it would be something of this order. And it's so remarkable that in spite of this tremendous difference of scale, yet the X-rays enable us to measure the distance between the centers of two carbon atoms to about one part in a thousand or even 10,000 if you take the necessary pains, but the latter effort would be a considerable one. Well then, so much perhaps for that diamond as a model. I might now perhaps think of one or two properties of the diamond that this model helps us to understand. We all look upon a diamond as something very hard. If you consider this for a moment, you'll see that each atom is so symmetrically situated with respect to its neighbors, if we may put it in words, it's so comfortably placed, it doesn't want to be shifted. And therefore, if you take a diamond and rub it on something else, it's the other thing that has to shift, not the carbons in the diamond. And that is why the diamond is so hard. Let me pass now from that, which we've structure we've known for some years, to something more modern. I want to show you, just for a minute, a structure of a substance which we've been working out in the last few months or year or two, which has a strange kinship with a diamond atom, and yet is totally unlike it in all its properties. I'm talking about a paraffin. A paraffin, not in exactly in the sense of paraffin oil, which is most the common use of the expression, but paraffin as a class of substances possessing certain properties. They're not all liquid. They're some of them solid, as we know. We often use paraffin for insulators in electrical work. Now, the chemist has investigated the structure of paraffins, and he tells us that the atoms of carbon, of which they mainly consist, are arranged in something of a chain order. He draws it like this. He says, a carbon, a carbon, a carbon, a carbon. It may be many carbons. We represent them like that. He says that each carbon has hydrogens attached to it, like that, all the way down the chain. And at the ends, there is one extra hydrogen, like that. And that's the chemist's picture of a paraffin, a long chain compound. Carbon atoms, curiously enough, have a certain preference for taking one or other of two forms, either 
the long chain like that, or the ring, which I drew before, and which is represented in this model. And those two classes of carbon atoms are, as we know, of enormous importance in the constitution of the world, and especially of living things. That is perhaps why they have a special interest, is because they're associated so much with life. The carbon rings are, as I say, the fundamental feature in many of the drugs which have a great influence on living things. The carbon chains are the fats and oils and paraffins and such like. Fats, of course, which we find in living bodies. This may be to look upon as a sort of prototype. You may put different endings on the chain. You may even order the sides of it here and there. But this long chain remains a sort of fundamental feature of all those substances which are found in organic bodies, in living bodies. Well, it is naturally of great interest when we had found out how to investigate the structure of bodies, to try and find what these organic substances looked like. And uh, this particular model that I've got here represents one of the results of our efforts. Now let me try to explain to you this model. <coughs> it represents a paraffin, one of the substances of which we've been speaking. These long successions of disks are the separate links in the paraffin chain. Uh, it mustn't trouble you that the representation here is by a white disk, whereas in the diamond it is by a black ball. Remember that in either case we do not know in the least what the atom is like. All we use either balls or disks for is to indicate position. Each of these then represents one of these chains. There are only five links in the chain as we've shown it, but in the model of the crystal which we investigated, there were more than that. In fact, the length of the chain is given by the formula C29H60. There must, of course, be twice as many hydrogen atoms as carbon atoms in the chain, and then two over to make up the additions at the end. So you must imagine that these chains are extended upwards to a sufficient height. We couldn't make the model a full size or it would have been too bulky. And there are enough here to indicate the various positions that these molecules take. Some you see are slanted slightly one way and some another. And the whole unit that makes up the pattern has to be represented by a sufficient number above and below this sheet. The scale is the same as the diamond. In fact, it is 450 millions to one. The form of the molecule, of the crystal, tells us that the molecule stands straight upwards, and the X-rays confirm this, and moreover, we find by comparison with other paraffins of different lengths of chain, that the length of the unit this way grows steadily, uh, atom by atom, the height of the unit cell being exactly proportional to the number of carbon atoms in the chain. The exact height is 77 angstrom units the angstrom unit being the uh, unit which we use in this particular work. Now, the, each of these disks, of course, represents a whole group. It represents this group which I'm outlining here, like that. And it represents that group. 
in the work which we do in trying to find the arrangement of the atoms in this long organic molecule. Um, the accuracy of the work is quite considerable. We cannot, it is true, say with any great exactness what the exact arrangement of each carbon and each hydrogen atom is, but we are able to discover certain facts which are sufficiently explained by the model. We know, for instance, that if we go straight up, the spacing is quite regular, just as the chemist draws it. Just as he draws his carbons in regular order like that, that order is actually preserved in the model. But we do find one new thing. We find that they cannot be absolutely in a straight line. In fact, the first, third, fifth, so on, are different to the second, fourth, sixth. Now, if you're going to make them different without altering their constitution, the only way to do them is, if they must be regularly arranged like that, and they're not in a line, they must be sidestepped, one that way, one that way, and one that way. And that is why they're so shown on the model. That is what the X-rays tell us, that there's a sort of zigzag arrangement like that, which the photographs we take unmistakably convey. Next, we get a good impression of how wide the molecule is, the, uh, the uh, molecules are apart, and we can compare what we get, curiously enough, with what the diamond has to tell us. After all, these are carbon atoms, just as much as those are. Is there anything in this structure to remind us of the diamond? Yes, there is, exactly. And that's one of the interesting points. Now let me turn this round, like that. And now look at this side. And now you observe the black disks in the middle of the white. Well, those black disks are drawn exactly as if we had represented a diamond there. Do you see, if I put, compare that side by side, say there, there and there, that ball comes up to a black disk, this to one, this to one, and this to one. In fact, when you look at the diamond itself, you see the zigzag. I put it upright like that. You see the zigzag of the chain. So the actual little bit of the diamond is reproduced in this paraffin. And not only then is the benzene ring, which chemists have made familiar to us, to be seen in the diamond itself, but also this curious zigzag arrangement, which is the foundation of the second great class of organic substances, those the long chains. And it's very odd that the diamond, which is, so to speak, the unique crystal of all, and the compound which consists entirely of carbon should find its chief features reproduced in the great list of organic substances which play such an important part in the world. This piece of work has not long been completed by Dr. Miller in the David Faraday laboratory. Now, if you wouldn't mind stepping up a little closer, quietly please, you will just be able to see what, how well this fits occurs. If I put this model of the diamond beside the molecule of paraffin, you observe how the zigzag in one exactly corresponds with the zigzag in the other. I want to explain that the white disc represents the group CH2, carbon and two hydrogens. The blacks we have put on ourselves as they would be if they followed this zigzag exactly along the chain. And the point is that the spacing is exactly right and the blacks fit inside the whites, leaving, so to speak, something for the hydrogens. Of course, the hydrogens must be so far extended in space, or at least the groups must be, that each molecule touches the next. And I may say that we nearly always find that when this grouping takes place, 
The distance between one group and another is three and a half angstrom units, a distance which I think is the same as what Langmuir finds in his chains. I may say one other point, perhaps. These long chains are ended by little groups of these C CH3 sets. The carbon here is very well surrounded by hydrogens. It's got no particular attractions for other atoms, these are not very strong. So where you see a molecule here joining on to those that are below, you must picture to yourselves that the three hydrogens round here are resting more or less on the hydrogens, the lower layer, and that there's no very strong affinity between them. In fact, the whole set of molecules up here forms a sheet. And that sheet is resting on another sheet down below. And the intervening molecules are hydrogens, groups of hydrogens, with very little attraction to one another. Now you see why paraffin is slippery. It's because these layers are able to slide on one another so easily because of the feeble attraction between layer and layer. And so one of the most interesting features of all this work that I've been trying to explain is that when you get your model complete, you begin to see explanations of those properties with which you've long been familiar. And that's, I think, perhaps the most interesting part of the work that we do. I may add a word about the method in which this particular model was obtained because it illustrates perhaps some of the difficulties of X-ray work. We were able to obtain paraffins in the form in which we ordinarily see them, a sort of white compact mass. With such masses containing, as we know, crystals irregularly distributed, crystals in flakes, irregular and pointing always, with such masses we can obtain certain information, but not all we should like. We can't get the details quite right. And we've sought a long time for a single perfect crystal of a paraffin. They're very rarely seen. It happened that one of the workers in the David Faraday laboratory remembered that in certain chemical investigations he'd once made of a rare oil, of an oil from the East Indies, super oil, there occurred crystals which were undoubtedly a paraffin, the constitution of which he himself had approximately determined. We got some of those crystals and found they were quite good. And it was one of those more or less perfect crystals that the work was finally brought to this particular stage. It's not complete now, for we don't know exactly what the size of the hydrogen atom is, nor the relative size of a carbon. All we know is the groups are spaced regularly like this, evenly spaced, the even spacing we know exactly, to one part in a thousand. We don't quite know how much they are sidestepped, but we do know roughly. Now this knowledge is the kind we gain from applying the X-rays to these bodies. The long chains are simply one particular set of organic substances. We should like to do the same with the rings. Now some progress is being made already. The long chains happen to be somewhat easier to work with. You can find the result of putting on different terminals, turning a paraffin into what is called a fatty acid. You can take a hydrogen away at various points along the chain and substitute an oxygen, making what chemists call a ketone. And we can find where that oxygen has been put on the chain and show how the <coughs> general shape of the crystal has been a little altered. And in this way we hope to go on and to find 
with many workers engaged as they are now, the structure of all these compounds and the relative positions of the atoms in these substances, and not only the organic substances to consider, but all the substances in nature with which we meet. And if we know how the atoms lie with respect to one another, we're able to gather information which helps us in understanding the properties of these bodies. The organic bodies, of course, depend almost entirely for their properties on the relative positions of the atoms and the molecules. That's why the organic chemist makes so much of what he calls stereometry. And if wave we'll X-rays can help him by showing exactly how the atoms are arranged, why then we are helping in a very useful way, I hope, to advance the cause of scientific knowledge. And that is really what this X-ray work is trying to do.